Welcome to a short history of computing. What we'll do in this presentation is just highlight some of the more important or significant events in the history of computing. And I hope that you'll walk away from this presentation with a deeper appreciation and understanding of just how far we've come in a relatively short amount of time. In a way, you can think of a computer as a device that helps humans perform calculations. You could argue that our fingers were some of the first aids used by humans to add and subtract. Our calculating tools have become much more sophisticated, but fingers are still widely used for addition, subtraction, and even multiplication. The abacus is a much more sophisticated device for performing calculations, and it's been used in various forms for thousands of years. You'll still find this tool used by merchants and clerks in parts of Asia and Africa. Let's now jump ahead a few years to the 1600s and examine some mechanical calculating machines that have been developed. The first is in 1610, the German Schickard invented a calculating machine that could add and subtract six-digit numbers. A few years later, Blaise Pascal, at the age of 19, invented another calculating machine. This one also could just do addition and subtraction. In 1694, the German Gottfried Leibniz invented a mecha mechanical calculator that could not only do it in addition and subtraction, but could also do multiplication and division. These were still quite a ways off from what we would now today call a computer. Jumping ahead to 1801, the Frenchman Joseph Jacquard invented a mechanical loom that would weave together threads based on the pattern of holes made in punched cards. This idea of controlling a machine with punched cards will be used by others, as we'll see later. The Jacquard loom was operated by individuals with few skills, and it could do the jobs of many highly skilled workers for a fraction of the cost. As these high skilled workers found themselves replaced by technology, it obviously caused a lot of conflict. This is a theme which continues even today. In the 19th century, an Englishman named Charles Babbage invented two machines which more closely resemble our modern day computer. Neither were completely built because of limited funds and other difficulties. The difference engine was to automate the solving of polynomial equations. The analytical engine was more like today's computer. It was not designed for any single purpose, but could be programmed using punched cards to solve any number of problems. It was completely mechanical and it was to be powered by steam. This invention has led Babbage to being called the father of the computer. Ada Lovelace gave significant assistance to Babbage in the development of the analytical engine. She created an algorithm for the analytical engine to make it compute Bernoulli numbers. Since the analytical engine never worked, her program could never be tested but she is nevertheless given the distinction in history as the first computer programmer. The 1880 U.S. Census took eight years to tabulate. It would have taken even longer to tabulate the 1890 census, but thankfully Herman Hollerith's tabulating machine was able to complete the tabulation in just a single year. The machine used punched cards to speed up the calculations. Hollerith founded a company which would later become part of IBM. In 1936, the Englishman Alan Turing described a theoretical device called the Turing machine. This hypothetical device manipulated symbols on a strip of tape according to rules from a table. This machine could simulate the logic of any computer algorithm. Turing was also instrumental in helping the Allies win World War II by cracking German military codes. Turing's contributions to computing have earned him the title Father of Computer Science. John Atanasoff and his graduate student Clifford Berry built the first fully electronic digital computing device at Iowa State University. They gave their device the very creative name Atanasoff Berry Computer, or ABC. This device was a lot like a modern day computer in that it was electronic rather than mechanical, and it was digital meaning that it used on and off states to represent data. But it was not programmable like today's computers. It was built to only solve systems of linear equations. And now we come to our first infamous quote. Thomas Watson Sr., the chairman of a company that would later be instrumental in the adoption of personal computers in every home, said, 
I think there is a world market for maybe five computers. This might seem very short-sighted, but at the time he was probably right. The computers which researchers were building were being funded primarily by governments at a huge cost. Only very large companies with a large staff of knowledgeable people would ever be able to support one of these computing devices or have it save them money in any way. This is my wife and me standing next to the Harvard Mark I, the first operational general purpose electromechanical computer. The computer is on display in the Computer Science Building at Harvard University. This machine was electromechanical, meaning it was not digital, so it was not quite like today's computers. The Mark I was designed by Howard Aiken, who later went on to build a Mark II, Mark III, and Mark IV. In case you were wondering, the Mark I could perform three additions, or one subtraction, per second. It took six seconds to perform multiplication, and 15 seconds to divide. In 1946, just after the end of World War II, John Motchley and Presper Eckert completed work on the ENIAC at the University of Pennsylvania. This was the first general purpose digital electronic computer, precisely what today's computers are. The ENIAC was originally programmed to compute ballistic firing trajectories to aid in the war. It took only 20 seconds to compute trajectories that would take 30 minutes for humans to compute. It was a huge computer. 30 by 30 feet and weighing 30 tons. It used vacuum tubes to represent digital information, or on and off states. These tubes would take a fair amount of electricity to run. They would run hot and they would burn out periodically. It would take a large team to program the ENIAC and keep it working. By the way, most of the ENIAC's programmers were women. I point this out because computer science has traditionally struggled to maintain females in significant numbers and it's something that most computing departments are struggling to correct. Grace Murray Hopper, a pioneer in computing, was working on the Mark II when she discovered a moth lodged in the computer's components. The term bug had been used for quite some time, but she made the terms bug and debugging more popular. You can see this bug at the Smithsonian's National Museum of American History in Washington, D.C. Computing power was helped immensely by the development of the transistor in 1947. It was much smaller than the vacuum tube, used less power, was more reliable, and was cheaper to produce. This allowed computers to greatly decrease in size and in energy requirements. In 1951, the designers of the ENIAC created the first commercially successful computer, the Univac 1. The fifth Univac machine was famously used to predict that Eisenhower would win the 1952 presidential election after it was fed a 1% sample from the voting population. With a very steep price tag, only 46 units were built and delivered. Fortran was the first successful high-level programming language, and it was invented by John Backus at IBM. Programming computers up to this time was very tedious. Programmers had to write very primitive instructions to move data in and out of the CPU and activate specific CPU instructions. A high-level programming language allowed the programmer to think at a higher level of abstraction. So instead of writing an instruction like, move this data into the first register and add it to the data in the second register, the programmer could instead write, the balance is equal to the balance plus interest. These high-level instructions are converted into lower-level machine instructions using something called a compiler. High-level languages are what most programmers use today to write software. The first program that demonstrated artificial intelligence by mimicking the problem-solving skills of a human was written in 1955. It wasn't until the following year that the term artificial intelligence would be coined. AI is a branch of computer science that forces us to examine what we define as intelligence. Is a computer that mimics a human's problem-solving skills considered intelligent, or is there something more to it? Only 11 years after the invention of the transistor came the integrated circuit, more commonly called the chip. This tiny piece of silicon has many of the electrical components of a computer. It's very inexpensive to produce, requires little energy, and is very reliable. Its small size revolutionized the computer industry as it allowed much smaller computers with significantly more computation power to be produced at a much lower cost. 
No history of computing would be complete if we didn't mention the very first computer game. Space War was written by Steve Russell and his team for the PDP-1 computer. You can actually play Space War on a PDP-1 computer at the Computer History Museum in Mountain View, California. The development of the integrated circuit several years earlier led researchers to put more and more transistors onto a chip. Gordon Moore, a co-founder of Intel, predicted in 1965 that chip producers would continue to double the number of transistors on a chip every year. This law has been changed to doubling every 18 months or two years, but it's been amazingly accurate over the past five decades. Gordon's law is not really a law, but it was a great prediction. The only problem is this exponential growth rate cannot continue due to the fundamental barriers imposed at the atomic level. It's likely that this growth will be flatlining in the near future. In the 1960s, the Department of Defense sponsored ARPA to produce a robust network of computers that were spread over great distances in the U.S. ARPA created the ARPANET, which would later be known as the Internet. It went live in 1969 with four nodes or connections, one at UCLA, one at Stanford, one at UC Santa Barbara, and one at the University of Utah. The first message ever transmitted over the ARPANET was the word login from UCLA to Stanford. Apparently the system crashed after it received the L and the O. I've been told on good authority that the internet is a lot more reliable today. Computers need software that manage and coordinate their hardware, internal memory, CPU, and other components. A very influential operating system was developed in 1970 called Unix. It was later rewritten using the C programming language, which is one of the most popular programming languages of all time. Unix has spawned a number of popular operating systems, including Mac OS X, Linux, and BSD. In 1971, the brains of the computer, the entire CPU, were shrunk onto a single chip. This makes for a significantly smaller and less expensive computer. The personal computer is now in sight. With the decrease in costs of ownership, computers were slowly making their ways into the home. One of the first personal computers was the Apple II, designed by Steve Wozniak. For $1,300, you could have your own personal computer with a 6502 microprocessor running at 1 MHz, 4 kilobytes of RAM, a data cassette for storing programs, and a video card that produced monochrome capital letters. The Apple II you see here has a five and a quarter inch floppy disk drive, which Apple introduced the following year. The Apple II series produced a family of computers, including the Apple IIc, which was the first computer I ever owned. And now we come to our next infamous quote. There is no reason anyone would want a computer in their home. Oh, Ken, Ken, Ken. The coming shift of computers in the workplace to computers in the home was apparently not obvious to everyone at the time. Do you remember the ARPANET coming online in 1969? Well, by the end of the 1970s, the ARPANET, or Internet, was gaining some traction, and quite a few individuals, mainly researchers at institutions across the U.S., were using the Internet to communicate via email. It was generally considered wrong to use the internet for anything personal since it was being funded by the government. That didn't stop Gary Thurk from sending the first spam message to every ARPANET address on the West Coast. Although the ARPANET community reacted very negatively to the message, the spam did generate some sales. Today, spam email makes up an estimated 70% of global emailing activity. The IBM personal computer sported an Intel microprocessor and a new operating system called DOS that a young Bill Gates licensed to IBM. The relatively inexpensive PC sold 300,000 units in 1981 and over 3 million units the following year. The PC was named Machine of the Year by Time Magazine and it made the young Bill Gates and his small company Microsoft very, very wealthy. One of the movies of my youth that made a profound impact on me was Tron. This was the first major film to use extensive 3D computer graphics. Although the graphics are primitive to what we have today, 
It was like seeing the Grand Canyon for the very first time. Of course, the movie business uses computer graphics extensively today, and entire movies are created by computer. In 1984, Jobs and Woz were about to change how everyday people interacted with computers. They had developed a computer called the Macintosh, and it used a graphical user interface, or GUI. It allowed the user to use a mouse to click, drag, and drop. This was opposed to the traditional command line interface that all PCs were using, where you had to type all of your commands. The GUI had been around for quite some time, having first been introduced in the 1960s by Doug Engelbart, but this was the first time that the GUI would become mainstream. So to introduce the world to the Macintosh, Apple made the most expensive commercial at the time, and they aired it just once during the 1984 Super Bowl. If you've never seen this commercial, look for it on YouTube. You won't be disappointed. In the commercial, you'll see Big Brother. This was supposed to represent IBM. Apple was going to liberate the world from IBM's ugly command line interface. One of the most notorious cases of software mishaps occurred over a two-year period in the mid-1980s. The Theric 25 was a third-generation radiation therapy device that would deliver x-rays to cancer patients via an electron gun. Unfortunately, there were several bugs and interface issues that caused the users operating the device to accidentally apply too much radiation to some patients. The bugs were difficult to find because the errors only occurred on rare occasions. Several people died from the overdoses and others were seriously injured before it was determined what was happening. And this is just one example of bugs in software that resulted in the loss of life, and there are other examples out there where individuals have died. Many more examples exist where millions of dollars of equipment have been damaged or lost due to bugs. The takeaway point is this. Writing error-free software is extremely difficult to do, especially as software continues to grow in complexity. Did you know that a typical new model vehicle has over 100 million lines of code in it? Considering how often you get app updates on your phone that fix bugs and programs with far fewer lines of code, what are the chances that your new car probably has at least one bug buried in those 100 million lines of code? Tim Berners-Lee was working in Geneva, Switzerland at CERN when he developed the World Wide Web. It was probably a little over the top to call it the World Wide Web at the time, but it caught fire very quickly. Sir Tim Berners-Lee has been knighted by the Queen of England for his invention. Bill Gates had been steadily improving his GUI imitation of the Macintosh for the IBM PC. The 3.1 release of Windows in 1992 was functional enough to become very popular, much to the dismay of Apple. Windows has continued to be very popular, although it looks like things are changing as the PC era is being left behind. AI had been making strides in a number of areas, but one of the most famous events occurred in 1997 when IBM's Deep Blue defeated the world chess champion Gary Kasparov. Kasparov actually accused IBM of cheating and demanded a rematch, but IBM refused. Another great quote from Ken Olson. I wouldn't put my company on the internet. Something tells me he's probably changed his mind. In 1998, two Stanford PhD students named Larry Page and Sergey Brin decided to drop their studies and start a search engine company called Google. Turned out their search engine was pretty good. So good that the word Google is often synonymous for web search. Some estimate that the web contains roughly 4 billion indexable web pages. Can you imagine how difficult it would be to find anything on the web without a good search engine? In 2003, it became painfully obvious that the internet was a dangerous place for your computer. Some of the most destructive worms and viruses were released, causing millions of dollars in damages. You were crazy if you didn't invest in a good antivirus software after 2003. As our world is becoming increasingly networked and computerized, the threats to our personal property and well-being are becoming even more pronounced. What do you think a virus could do to an automobile traveling at 70 miles per hour? Or to a person's pacemaker? What if your home's appliances were all controlled by a computer? Do you think a virus could do some serious damage? The growth and popularity of the web in the 1990s 
led to the development of online social networks in the 2000s. Can you imagine what it was like before online social networks, not being able to instantly inform all of your friends what coffee you ordered at Starbucks? Okay, I don't even want to go there. You may remember me talking about Moore's Law and the fact that we are getting close to the end of our abilities to squeeze more transistors onto a chip. Well, to combat this limitation, computer manufacturers have started producing multi-core processors or multiple CPUs that work together on the same chip. So instead of the computer being able to perform a single task at one time, multiple cores can be working on different tasks simultaneously. Any new smartphone or tablet that you purchase today is likely to have a multi-core processor in it. After introducing the world to the GUI in 1984, Steve Jobs and Apple had another huge breakthrough in 2007 when they introduced the iPhone. Although touchscreen interfaces had existed before this, the iPhone made them popular for smartphones, and every smartphone manufacturer has followed Apple's lead. Two years later, Google introduced the Android operating system, which is currently the iPhone's biggest rival. Three years later, Apple reinvigorated the tablet market by bringing their touchscreen operating system to the tablet. Other manufacturers have followed Apple's lead, and there are now many tablets running Android, Windows, and other operating systems. Tablet sales are expected to eclipse PC sales in 2015. IBM made headlines again in 2011 when their Watson system defeated veteran Jeopardy! champions. This was a huge feat in AI because it involved answering questions that were posed in natural language, a task that has been very difficult for computer systems in the past. Watson had used 200 million pages of information as well as the full text of Wikipedia in order to answer the Jeopardy! questions, but it did not use the internet during the game. This achievement highlights just how much gain AI researchers have made in the past few decades. Google strayed from the search engine business in 2012 to create the first self-drivable car that was awarded a card license in Nevada. The infinity symbol on the license plate indicates that the car is licensed to drive itself. Like IBM's Watson, this achievement highlights other gains made in AI and it likely won't be long before we find this driverless technology in newer vehicles. Google excited geeks everywhere by introducing Google Glass, a wearable computer that can interact with its owner using voice commands. It contains a screen that only the user can see, and it has a camera that can take pictures or record video. Not to be outdone, Apple is apparently working on a wristwatch that will operate kind of like an iPhone. It's not a stretch to say that these wearable devices will likely be common in the near future. That is, if everyone doesn't mind looking like a cyborg. So what does the future hold? Some researchers are focusing on smart clothing, where the computer is part of your wardrobe, just like the watch or glasses. These computers could be powered by the natural movements of the wearer. Researchers are also focusing on brain-powered legs, arms, and hands, especially as the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq have caused many servicemen and women to lose their limbs. This is somewhat connected to gesture recognition, where computers can recognize what the user wants based on interpreting human gestures. Microsoft's Connect is a push in this direction, and perhaps the gesture interface will completely replace the touch interface someday. There's a lot of research being done on quantum computers, computers that use quantum mechanical phenomena to perform computations. These computers are in their infancy, but they show promise being able to solve certain problems much faster than classical computers. There are many other directions that computing will take us in the future, and I've only touched on a few. This last one is just for fun. You've probably seen The Terminator, The Matrix, or any number of movies that show computers becoming more intelligent than men and bad things happening as a result. The singularity is this theoretical emergence of the superintelligent computer, this point in time when the computer will be able to outthink its creator. One of the biggest proponents of the singularity is Ray Kurzweil, a computer scientist and futurist who says that all advances in computing over the past century point to the year 2045 as the year the singularity will appear. If he's right, this is the day that Google will zap you while you're wearing your Google Glass. 
will drive you into a wall while you're riding in their car and will plug everyone else's brain into their search index. And now you have been warned.